This meeting will come to order. This is a public meeting of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I'd like to welcome members of the public and market participants who are listening on the phone or watching our WebEx. I'd also like to welcome my fellow commissioners who are joined with me here today virtually, Commissioner Quintens, Commissioner Benham, Commissioner Stump, and Commissioner Berkovitz. As always, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll lead and anyone is welcome to join. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States, States of America and to the republic to the for republic. which it stands, it stands. one nation, one under, nation. God, under God, God. Individual, individual, liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. Yeah. Thank you. During today's open meeting, we'll be discussing and voting on one final rule. We'll also be executing a memorandum of understanding with the Office of Financial Research. For the final rule, we'll hear a staff presentation before the commission deliberates and votes. For the MOU, we'll hear a staff presentation and then a statement from our special guest, Director Dina Falaschetti of the Office of Financial Research. Before uh, the director and I sign the MOU. We'll now move to make a longer closing statement if they wish. Since becoming chairman, I've prioritized improving the CFTC's approach to collecting data. As a federal agency, we've got to be selective about the data we collect and then make sure we're actually making good use of the data for its intended purpose. For example, we recently adopted three rules to revise the CFTC's regulations on swap data reporting. Today, we're engaged in a similar exercise. We're considering whether to adopt amendments to the compliance requirements for commodity pool operators who file on form CPO PQR. In plain English, for those the way in which they report their information is through our form CPO PQR. The amendments we're voting on today reflect the CFTC's reassessment of the scope of the form and how it aligns with our current regulatory priorities. By refining our approach to data collection, the final rule will re reduce the reporting burdens for market participants. I'll now, I won't, I'm not going to address the shortcomings in the open meeting of the current form. Um, I'll publish a statement later that details some of those. But to, to, suffice it to say that as the CFTC staff has reviewed the data over the years, it's become apparent that the disparate, infrequent, and delayed nature of CPO reporting has not met our needs. This is largely because the conditions and relative CPO risk profiles may have changed potentially significantly by the time the form is actually filed with us, the CFTC. As I've said before, what we need is not over-regulation or even deregulation, but sound regulation. Uh, right now, we are facing uh, the biggest economic challenge since the Great Depression. And at the same time, we're asking a lot of our market participants to file a bunch of forms. Um, and so if those forms and the data they're providing ultimately are, are not what we need, then I think it's incumbent upon us to, to think about it and to, to make changes where necessary. Um, it's also important to note that form EPO PQR is not our only source of data regarding commodity pools. In fact, the CFTC over the years has devoted substantial resources to developing other data streams and regulatory initiatives designed to enhance our ability to see what's happening in financial markets. These data streams also include extensive relation, information related to the trading, reporting, and clearing of swaps, and we're also developing a, a special tool for funds. Finally, it's important to note that the rule does simply more than eliminate data collections. It also requires something to be collected that we've never collected before, a key piece of information, which is legal identity, legal entity identifiers, or LEIs, uh, for both the CPOs and their operated pools. LEIs are critical to un understanding the activities and interconnectedness within our financial markets. So for all of those reasons, I am very pleased to support today's final rule. Uh, with that, I would like to open my, I uh, would like to recognize my fellow commissioners for any opening statements you might have. Uh, starting with Commissioner Quintet. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you. Good morning to my fellow commissioners. It's great to see all of you. I think this is the first meeting that we have done with live video feeds, and I'm uh, thrilled to be able to uh, participate today in that kind of format. I'm 
looking forward to doing it in person, but this is a wonderful second option. I'd like to compliment uh, our Office of Data and Technology for um, ensuring that we can um, do this to some degree face-to-face -face and the, the public has the benefit of uh, seeing all of us uh, being able to interact. So my compliments to them. I'm not going to give a full opening statement. I'm going to give a statement during my uh, question and answer period today. Uh, but I'd like to compliment you, Mr. Chairman, on the hard work uh, of getting this rule across the finish line. I'm going to be pleased uh, to support it uh, today. Um, and uh, uh, thank you very much to DSIO for their hard work uh, on uh, both of the issues we're uh, facing today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Quinten. Commissioner Benham. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to my fellow commissioners uh, and you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I think I'm not going to have a prepared statement either. I will post it to the website uh, shortly, but I look forward to supporting um, both of the matters today and, and certainly thank staff from DSIO and uh, uh, echoing Commissioner Quintenson's comment about uh, our data and technology group. This is great to be uh, together with some video uh, in addition to the audio and uh, look forward to um, debating these issues and, and moving forward with both audio and video uh, in future meetings. So thanks again, and I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Stump. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you all so much for um, the efforts to bring us all together. The team that has enabled us to do this, I can't tell you how pleased I am to see everyone's faces. So thanks to ODT and also the teams that put this rule together. We've spent, um, ever since I arrived at the commission, we've been working on refining the data that we require to do our jobs. And I'm pleased that we were able to do so with regard to swap data reporting a few weeks ago. And I'm very supportive of moving forward with refining forms CPO, PQR. Um, I'm pleased we're doing it both as it relates to improving the data and the utility of the data for our, per, our regulatory purposes, but also from a data scoping and protection perspective. So I, I don't have a formal opening um, comment, but I just wanted to note that I'm pleased to support the rule, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Berkovitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I, too, am very pleased uh, that we've been able to move to this uh, video format in addition to the audio format. Obviously, I'm very much looking forward to the day, uh, hopefully uh, in the not-too-distant future when we'll be back in person again. But uh, this is the best available technology uh, until we reach that point in time. I was somewhat being concerned about on all the telephone calls being a faceless bureaucrat, uh, but now I'm a bureaucrat with a face, so uh, I'm pleased uh, pleased to be here today. Uh, I too will have a statement that I'm going to be uh, posting on onto the website. Uh, I will be supporting uh, today's rule. Uh, uh, I've always been supportive of using the best available data to make our decisions. Uh, if data is no longer um, useful or hasn't turned out to be as useful as we anticipated. Um, by all means, uh, we, we should not be collecting unnecessary data. At the same time, um, we can, if we can improve our, our data collection efforts and make better use of our data, I'm, I'm all for that too. So I think the rule um, strikes a reasonable balance between eliminating uh, data that is, is the Commission has not been using and yet preserving the, the data that the Commission um, uh, believes will be useful to it, uh, and uh, I'm supporting the continue about, continued evaluation of, of, of our data needs. So I'm looking forward to uh, today's discussion. Um, thank you all again. Thank you very much, Commissioner Berkovitz. We'll now move to consideration of the final rule amending the compliance requirements for commodity pool operators on form CPO PQR. After the presentation, the floor will be open for one round of questions and remarks from each commissioner. Following the close of discussion, the commission will vote on the rule. The votes conducted in this public meeting will be recorded votes. The results of the votes approving the issuance of rulemaking documents will be included with those documents in the Federal Register. To facilitate the preparation of the approved documents for publication in the Federal Register, I now ask the Commission to grant unanimous consent for staff to make the necessary technical corrections prior to submitting them to the Federal Register. So moved. Second. Thank you. Without objection, so ordered. 
All right. So now we are moving on to the final rules amending the compliance requirements for CPOs on Form CPO PQR. So at this time, I'd like to welcome the following staff for their presentation. From the Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight, and for those of you watching at home, that's basically our division that focuses on market participants, we have uh, our director, Josh Sterling, Pamela Garrity, Associate Director, and Elizabeth Gruber, Special Counsel. I also want to take a moment to, to recognize others, because as my colleagues mentioned, a lot of work has gone into this rule, and normally you don't see the federal government putting a lot of time and effort and continuing thought into a form. But this is a really important form, as my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, the data that we collect is really important, and we want to we want to really be thoughtful and careful about that. So there are a lot of other people that have contributed to this rulemaking. So from uh, the same division as, as Josh and the others, we have Amanda O'Lear, our Deputy Director. Thank you for joining us. Chris Cummings, Special Counsel. And then from our Office of General Counsel, we have Dan Davis, our General Counsel. Deputy General Counsel, Carlene Kim. Associate General Counsels, Paul Schlichstein and Leanne Duffy. Also, our Chief Economist Office has helped out. First and foremost, our Acting Chief Economist, Scott Mixon, and Gloria Clement, Senior Special Counsel. And then finally, the commissioners themselves were very active and involved with this rule, and it couldn't have been done without uh, a number of people from the commissioner's offices. So from the commissioner's offices, uh, clearly important to this rulemaking were Mar Margot Bailey, Laura Gardy, Lucy Hines, Dan Buska, and Matt Dagler. So with that, I will hand it over to Josh, uh, Pamela, and Elizabeth, uh, and Amanda for your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for those remarks, and, and good morning to you, and good morning to the Commission. Uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, after a late summer respite, it's great to be back before you with another final rule for your consideration. We're here today to present our recommendation to adopt amendments to our Commodity Pool Operator or CPO Reporting Form, Form CPO PQR. We in the World Class Division of DSIO fully endorse this final rule and ask for your approval. Members of my great team, whom you just mentioned, Mr. Chairman, wrote the rule and will walk you through the specifics in just a minute. Before they do so, however, I'll take just a few moments to explain why the form is a valuable tool for the agency and for the division in carrying out a smart, effective, and practical program designed to pursue the CFTC's mission, vision, and values. It's adopted, today's rule action will streamline CPO reporting in many key respects. We think that's a significant and positive development. After seven or so years having the form, we took stock of what works well, what can work better, what we think we don't really need. So we will, for now, continue to collect data from CPOs, but we will do so in a way that improves the regulatory experience of those registrants. This is a core commitment of the chairman and the executive team on which I serve, and indeed, it's a good one for a federal agency that has such a strong record of effective oversight. This action, however, is not meant to cast any doubt on the principle that absent other available resources, which we will explore, our registrants should be expected to report meaningful data that further our effective oversight of their compliance with the Commodity Exchange Act and the Commission's regulations. Certainly, what data we ask them to report requires a discerning look from time to time. And as I observed to you during our conversation about the proposal in April, the form definitely did need a hard look. I may have even described it at that time as kind of like a Jackson Pollock thing in the service of what we called the regulator's ragu rationale. That is, the information we need must be in there somewhere. The rule changes today do reflect a discerning look, so I'm comfortable saying that when we review the take from the revised form, I'm confident our minds will not be drawn to obscure terms from the art world like chiaroscuro and impasto, nor will we suddenly have an inexplicable longing for spaghetti dressed in America's staple marinara sauce. I'm a Prego man myself anyway. I believe that quarterly data about commodity pools will remain a critical feature of our oversight framework. We will continue to explore how the data can best be collected and what data we really need, whether in the format contemplated by the revised form 
in some improved way or with the replacement of current data calls in the form with others that are more tailored to our needs. Who knows? Maybe we will even be able to achieve a single unified reporting form through continued collaboration with our great friends and partners at the SEC. It's also possible we could potentially obtain needed pool-specific data from other sources. But in whatever format and from whichever source pool-specific data come to us, there are three main reasons why gathering and reviewing data at the individual pool level is critical. First, funds rarely trade derivatives in isolation. Therefore, understanding the cash market securities derivative positions is important to us. From basis trading to global macro and all the way out the curve to volatility and inverse volatility strategies. Derivatives, markets, derivatives market data alone will never tell us what a fund means to do more broad, broadly in making its derivatives trade. And that is indeed a paramount consideration for us in pursuing our investor protection mandate for commodity pool investors. Second, funds are among the largest sources of liquidity in our markets, and their investment decision-making is becoming more concentrated. It's axiomatic that to provide liquidity is to transmit risk. At scale, that can have an outsized impact both on our market infrastructure and on commercial end users, meaning that farmers, ranchers, and energy producers that rely on our markets being deep, liquid, and orderly when they go to hedge the real-world risks it can affect family budgets for hot meals, warm homes, and online access to remote learning. Third, the asset management industry is getting bigger, faster, and stronger. Asset managers of scale are emerging. I've been told that a trillion dollars in asset center management is table stakes to be in the bulge bracket over the next decade. Fewer firms are making a bigger share of trading decisions to drawing a bead on how those views are expressed across specific funds over time only makes sense. Ladies and gentlemen, I make these points with confidence as the only funds lawyer to, to direct this division and perhaps one of the few ever to have worked at this agency. My view on pool-specific data is only reinforced with the recent success this agency has experienced by refining other data tools to achieve record results. I refer most immediately to the Commission's $920 million settlement, J.P. Morgan, for spoofing. As recent press coverage has made clear, that case resulted from a commitment this agency made to up its game in market surveillance and enforcement. Faced with terabytes of exchange data, the agency invested the time and talent necessary to deploy data tools to get the job done. And boy, have our colleagues in the Division of Enforcement done so. I'll add that of particular interest to me is that the agency's case involved data that, according to public reports, went back as far as eight years I will say that again, eight years. That's 32 quarters ago. So it would be no good criticism of the form in full to say that data are useless if they are but a single quarter only, single quarter old, excuse me. Far from it for the three reasons I just articulated. Now at the same time, and as the chairman intimated, we are indeed hard at work implementing a CPO data tool that will use market data to provide us the real-time view of market activity between CPOs and futures brokers. As I mentioned a moment ago, asset managers are indeed getting bigger, faster, and stronger, and I think in deploying a follow-the-sun architecture for its trading desks. So seeing how the exposures expand and contract on a day-to-day -day basis is critical for this agency. The CPO data tool does that already. But it's equally important to understand the strategies of individual funds and their related positions in cash and other derivatives markets over time. Looking at market-based data, the A historical volatility in February 18 and March 20 was important. Knowing at that time which funds were pursuing volatility macro and basis trading strategies, according to PQR data, will only enrich that kind of market-based understanding. So, we come before you today not to limit our ability to understand how funds work in our markets, but rather to focus our energies around data that indeed enrich our understanding of market activity and investor protection. This is but another example of my team's smart, effective, and practical approach. Before handing it over to my, my colleagues, uh, who did just a terrific job here, uh, I will note that uh, I, I would like to also extend my thanks to thank my division to, to the same folks that the chairman identified. So we certainly extend a heartfelt thanks to the rest of the team in the division 
commissioner's offices, the chief economist, and the general counsel as well. Couldn't have done this, uh, if ever, without you. And if you'll indulge me a minute more, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I want to take this opportunity publicly and on the official record to thank the Director of Enforcement, Jamie McDonald, for a strong partnership with me over the last 15 months. We have made tremendous strides in strengthening the already strong working relationship between our two divisions. I believe my division referred cases that made up about 10% of enforcement's record docket this past year. The divisions can still do more together, and that is all possible because of Jamie's great uh, leadership. As I recently told him, when I interviewed the chairman for this position, I thought it would be a great job, but I got it. Then when I met Jamie, I knew it was something I absolutely had to do. He's an exemplar of public service, a dogged prosecutor guided by a keen intellect, an abiding sense of duty to our nation. True patriot, great colleague, and even better friend. I thank him for the impact he's had on the division and on me personally, and I look forward to our continued friendship in the years to come. With that, I will now hand over the presentation to my team. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for that introduction, and good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, this final rule will, if adopted, finalize the Commission's April 2020 proposal amending Regulation 4.27 and Form CPOPQR, a data collection form required to be filed by registered commodity pool operators with respect to their commodity pools operated pursuant to that registration. Specifically, the Commission's proposal outlines several specific amendments to Form CPOPQR, producing what we will generally refer to today as revised Form CPOPQR. The proposed amendments included, one, the elimination of Schedule D and C of the form, except for the Pool Schedule of Investments, or PSOI, two, the addition of prompts for legal entity identifiers, or LEIs, for filing CPOs and their operative pools that already have and use them, Three, the elimination of questions regarding pool auditors and marketers. Four, the deletion of all trading thresholds and filing categories as a result of the proposed elimination of Schedule B and C. Five, the adoption of a quarterly filing schedule for all reporting CPOs, regardless of their operational size. And finally, six, replacing the substituted compliance mechanism for Form PF a form previously developed jointly by this commission with the Securities and Exchange Commission with substituted compliance treatment for NFA form PQR, a quarterly pool filing developed and required by the National Futures Association. The commission received strongly supportive com public comments in response to this proposal. Commenters considered the proposal and revised form CPO PQR generally as helpful improvements to the current system and a significant effort by this commission to simplify CPO reporting requirements while still ensuring that CPOs and their commodity pools are subject to effective oversight through appropriate levels of regulation. In particular, commenters were in favor of the revised form's simplified structure and uniform filing schedule, and they praised the proposal's effort to tailor CPO regulatory reporting requirements. Having briefly discussed the proposal and the generally favorable reactions to it, I will now pass the presentation over to Pamela Garrity to begin discussing specific details of the final rule before the commission today. Thank you, Elizabeth. And good morning, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. Staff continues to believe that these amendments will produce a more streamlined and focused data collection regarding registered CPOs and their operated pools that would be better designed to be utilized in conjunction with data streams the Commission has developed in the seven years since Form CPO PQR was originally adopted. Consequently, after review of the public comments received and additional consideration of the proposed amendments, staff recommends that the Commission finalize its proposal from the spring by adopting those amendments to Form CPO PQR and Regulation 4.27 largely as proposed. Staff also notes that the final rule amendments presented here today are intended to constitute the first of several steps in an ongoing assessment of Form CPO PQR, the substantive information it seeks to collect and the form and manner in which it collects that information. 
Like the proposal, the final rule would collectively result in a revised form CPO PQR that is considered primarily of the information currently solicited by the form Schedule A with an additional prompt for LEIs to the extent that a CPO has them, and the PSLI from Schedule B, although the concept of individual schedules is abandoned in the revised form. Commenters strongly favored the proposed elimination of the detailed pool-specific information solicited in Schedules B and C, and staff continues to believe that these amendments will generally produce a targeted data collection with respect to CPOs and uh, their commodity pool activity that is both more complete and more usable by the Commission in its oversight of CPOs on the revised form. With respect to the pool schedule of investments, or PSOI, staff continues to recommend the adoption of the proposed PSOI, including the retention of the 5% reporting threshold notwithstanding commenters' recommendations to the contrary. Multiple commenters recommended two modifications to the PSOI. The first was the elimination of certain subcategories of asset classes for which CPOs must report investment positions. And the second was an increase in the reporting threshold for such investment positions from the current 5% to 10%. Those changes taken together would align the revised form into the pool's holdings across all of the asset classes to which it is exposed. Therefore, staff believes that reducing the amount of information collected with respect to the PSOI's multiple asset classes prior to assessing the quality of the data produced by the revised form is premature. Regarding the reporting threshold for the PSOI, staff continues to recommend the retention of the 5% threshold. In arriving at this conclusion, staff reviewed previous form CPO PQR filings for the purpose of determining the amount of data that would be lost if the reporting threshold were increased to 10%, and we determined that that amount would be material. As a result, staff concluded that retaining the 5% reporting threshold in the PSLI was appropriate. As I previously mentioned, in staff's view, this final rule is the first of several steps in the Commission's reevaluation of Form CPO PQR and its needs in the CPO space. As such, staff will reevaluate the PSOI recommended today within 18 to 24 months of the revised Form's first compliance date and will make a recommendation at that time as to whether further modification of the PSOI is appropriate. Now, turning to LEIs. As proposed, staff continues to recommend requiring CPOs that have and use LEIs to report them on revised form CPO PQR with respect to the CPO entity and their operated pools that trade swaps. In the proposal, the Commission stated its hope that by incorporating LEIs into the revised form, it would be enabled to more efficiently and accurately synthesize information from various data streams on an entity-by-entity -entity basis thereby permitting better and more coordinated use of the data collected to illuminate risks in pools or pool families. Commenters were generally in favor of the proposed LEI prompt, understanding its purpose and role in developing fulsome and holistic surveillance programs with respect to reporting CPOs and their commodity pools. Several commenters also recommended the expansion of the proposed LEI prompt such that all CPOs reporting on the revised form would be required to obtain and then provide an LEI in order to satisfactorily meet the reporting requirement. Staff declined this recommendation, however, because the addition of an LEI prompt to the revised form is inherently limited by the fact that LEIs are not currently collected with respect to futures transactions, meaning that CPOs and their pools are not currently required to have LEIs in order to participate in the futures market. Staff believes that under these circumstances, it would neither advance the Commission's regulatory goals of monitoring the market and systemic risks of CPOs in their pools, nor facilitate the integration of usable Commission data for effective oversight to such CPOs and pools, if the Commission explicitly required all reporting CPOs and their operating pools to obtain and list LEIs on the revised form at this time. Staff notes that the final rule would require CPOs to report their LEIs 
to the extent they obtain one at any point in the future. And thus, it contemplates the expansion of LEIs on the revised form as more entities obtain them. Therefore, staff today recommends the addition to revised form CPOPQR of an LEI prompt for those reporting CPOs and commodity pools engaged in swap transactions, as proposed, and commits to continuing to monitor developments with respect to LEIs and their role in the commodity interest markets in order to consider both the propriety of expanding the LEI requirements in the future for all reporting CPOs, as well as how such data should be collected and stored for cybersecurity purposes. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Elizabeth so she can address the last remaining items in the final rule for your consideration today. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, the final rule also would adopt amendments to the form's instructions and definitions which, importantly, shapes the filing schedule, structure, and scope of revised form CPO PQR reporting. Commenters praise the proposed uniform quarterly filing schedule <clears throat> excuse me, for all registered CPOs required to report on the form, even though that would require the reporting of some information more frequently than is currently required. Overall, commenters appreciated the simplicity of a uniform filing schedule that is consistently applied to all reporting CPOs regardless of their operational size, that requires no staff continues to recommend the adoption of a quarterly filing schedule for all registered CPOs required to report their commodity pool activity on revised form CPO PQR, which is reflected in appropriate explanatory instructions in the revised form. Commenters also requested several specific edits to the proposed instructions assisting staff by flagging those provisions that seemed no longer relevant or internally inconsistent with other aspects of the proposed amendment. After a thorough review of the proposal and the comments, the final rule recommended by staff today includes explicitly proposed amendments like the removal of questions regarding marketers and auditors, as well as substantive and technical edits to the definitions and instructions that were identified both by both commenters and staff. Given the substantial edits that were proposed, commenters also requested that the Commission consider amending the 2015 CPO PQR FAQs, such that the FAQs would be consistent with the content and filing of revised form CPO PQR and Regulation 4.27 as amended by this final rule. Staff agrees that if the final rule is adopted today, much of the information currently in the 2015 FAQs will become obsolete or inaccurate. To address commenters' valid concerns about this information becoming outdated, staff carefully reviewed the FAQs during the process of drafting the final rule and has revised them significantly. Staff expects to submit in the near future these updated draft FAQs for the Commission to consider publishing. Staff further recommends that the Commission amend Regulation 4.27 generally as proposed, such that, one, CPOs required to report on revised form CPO PQR will be allowed to file NFA form PQR for purposes of meeting this reporting requirement, and two, form PS will no longer be so accepted by the Commission, though it will remain a Commission form. Importantly, and as it did in presenting the proposal, Staff makes this recommendation on the basis that NFA will amend its NFA form PQR to also permit the reporting of LEIs by CPOs and pools that use them, rendering NFA form PQR and the Commission's revised form substantively identical. Commenters generally praised the proposal's amendments regarding substituted compliance. They stated that permitting substituted compliance with NFA form PQR a form that CPOs are also already required to file on a quarterly basis as NFA members, offers additional filing efficiencies without compromising the Commission's ability to obtain relevant and quality data from reporting CPOs. To provide sufficient clarity on this issue and in response to comments received, staff also recommends adding a specific instruction to the revised form that clearly explains the substituted compliance treatment of NFA form PQR. Staff further recommends that going forward, the commission utilize its existing authority under the Commodity Exchange Act for the review of registered futures association membership rule changes 
to ensure that NSA Form PQR continues to be substantively identical to the revised form and thus that substitute compliance remains appropriate. With respect to Form PS, this commission also proposed to no longer accept the FCC's form in lieu of Form CPO PQR because if amended as proposed, revised Form CPO PQR and Form PS would diverge significantly in terms of substance, form, and even filing schedule. Because the final rule adopts those amendments largely as proposed, staff continues to believe that this divergence will occur. Although reactions to this proposed amendment were mixed, most commenters agreed with and supported it. Additionally, in staff's opinion, continuing to accept Form PF in lieu of the revised form would clearly frustrate a stated purpose of this rulemaking project, namely to enhance and better coordinate the Commission's collected CPO and pool data to more efficiently and effectively oversee these registrants and their trading of commodity interests. Finally, Staff recognizes that reporting CPOs will need time to adjust to filing revised form CPO PQR pursuant to the final rules amendment. To that end, staff recommends that the commission not require form CPO PQR filings for the reporting period ending December 31, 2020, and first require the filing of revised, of revised form CPO PQR for pool trading activities during the first quarter of 2021. Consistent with Regulation 4.27 and the revised form, this approach means that reporting CPOs would not be required to complete and file revised form CPO PQR for their operated pools until May 30, 2021, or 60 days after the first 2021 reporting period ends. Thank you for listening. This concludes our presentation of the final rule amending form CPO PQR and Regulation 4.27. We would be happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Uh, well, thank you very much, Josh, Pamela, and Elizabeth for an excellent presentation, as well as your outstanding work in preparing this rulemaking for our consideration. Uh, to begin the Commission's discussion and consideration of the rulemaking, I'll now entertain a motion to adopt the final rule amending the compliance requirements for CPOs on Form CPO PQR. So moved. Second the motion. Thank you. I'd now like to open the floor for commissioners to ask any questions about the rule. I'll start. Um, uh, Josh, you mentioned that CPOs now are, I think you used the, the, the phrase, bigger, faster, and stronger. Could you just maybe give us a little bit more insight into how many CPOs there are out there and, and the magnitude of, of these funds? Sure, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. Happy to do that. So we have approximately 1,200 firms registered with us as CPOs. Um, you know, and I think over the last 10 years or so, I've observed uh, in prior practice before coming here, we've seen a significant number of mergers uh, between firms, including firms that are registered as CPOs with us. And you can measure uh, a CPO and its potential market impact by its scale, by uh, asset center management. And uh, I guess when I started in this business, you know, uh, a couple hundred billion under management was quite a lot. And now we have firms that, you know, one, two, four, five trillion under management, and that's retail as well as institutional money. And as the firms get, get bigger, there's a greater concentration, I think, of decision making. Um, and then a combination of funds that can come with that. And so we're sort of seeing a bit of concentration, uh, including uh, in the context, I should say, of overall growth. Right. No, that, that's great with that granular data. I mean, I'll make an observation from my position, uh, not, not as CFTC chair so much as being a former member of the Financial Stability Board, being a current member of FSOC, and then also being vice chair of IOSCO, my observation is that over the last 10 years, particularly post-crisis, we have seen continued growth in these funds, in part, I think, because a lot of the risk that was being housed in the banking sector, a sector that was, was essentially uh, you know, backed uh, directly or indirectly, as the case may be, by deposit insurance, um, ultimately U.S. taxpayers, as well as discount window access, a lot of that risk because of regulation and, and just because of a number of other factors has actually migrated um, to the fund sector. 
Now, that said, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. In fact, I think there are many positive uh, attributes that, that, that come with that, in fact, because I think a lot of the, the, the lending, the intermediation, the credit providing, particularly in, in things that are more risky, uh, I think having them migrate from the banking sector to the fund sector is a good thing for the financial system, and I think it makes our financial system stronger. Uh, I would even argue that our funds and our sort of our, our asset management sector in the United States, whether that's sort of traditional types of mutual funds and things, ETFs, or even hedge funds and, and private equity funds, I think is the envy of the world. Um, now, that said, uh, I think that does mean, however, that, that we need to make sure that we understand what's going on in that. And, and, to some, and, and that is really what our CPO regime is, is, is focused on alongside the SEC's uh, regime, which obviously focuses on the entire sector. We are focused on where, where the funds folk, you know, have investments of a certain magnitude in derivatives and commodity instruments. So based on, on everything, I guess uh, the question for the, for the team is right now for the, for the current version, or I should say the soon to be current version of CPO PQR, is there a regulatory use case for the data? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that and for those observations as well. And I, I would just add to what you had said that, that uh, funds aren't intermediaries, which is an important thing to remember. But to your question, uh, yes, uh, there is indeed a strong regulatory use case for the reasons that the staff and I have articulated. The ability to understand what's going on in funds, the ability to understand our investor protection focus alongside market data sources we can use on a more real-time basis. No, that's right. And let me just, uh, on, on the point that you made about funds and, and their, their intermediary role, it's very important that funds, uh, at, at least when it comes to investors, are equity investments. Uh, so it's not the same as deposits or whatever. Now, these funds may have uh, leverage with, with other institutions, but, but you know, there is a major distinction between um, depositing funds in a bank account and depositing funds in a mutual fund in terms of the type of investment. And that's something that I think the larger international system is, 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 is working on and thinking about and deliberating on. Um, I guess one of the other uh, things that you mentioned, which is really important, is it's not just about the derivatives activities of these funds, which arguably we could get by looking at futures markets and even looking at some of the, some of the data that we get from our swaps regime, but really understanding the relationships between these funds, their derivative positions, and their cash positions. And in many ways, when I, when I let's put CPOs aside, for example, we do a lot of that same kind of rigorous analysis, analysis for example, in the energy markets and the agriculture markets. So important to understand what's going on in the cash markets so we can link the two and ensure, for example, in the futures markets that there's convergence. And so what I take from your, your uh, is a central point is that it's important that we understand the entire portfolios of the pool so we can make that connection. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, they're related positions. They, they work in tandem with each other, and it's, it's quite important. Yes. Alongside data tool that you're developing. Yes, I do. And, and that data tool is extremely powerful, but it's our market data. It's not pool-specific portfolio data, and we are completely open to um, other sources and other ways to get at that pool-specific data, but the simple answer is yes, sir. Great. And, and there, there has been a lot of discussion among, among uh, the, the public as, as well as here at the Commission on the schedule of investments uh, and its utility, um, and, but I think there, there is a specific provision in the preamble that requires us to, to take a look at it and to sort of justify our use of the data going on. Uh, are you committed to reviewing the use case for the schedule of investment as we proceed along? Yes, sir. Unequivocally, we are committed to that. Okay. Well, no, no further questions from me. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Quintens. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Josh and Amanda and Elizabeth and Pamela for uh, their hard work on this and um, the presentation this morning. I think I'll start by um, reading a statement and maybe making a few reactions, and then if you'll indulge me, indulge me asking a few questions. 
I mean, I, I, I'm going to support today's uh, final rule that would simplify and streamline the reporting obligations of commodity pool operators on Form CPOPQR. The Commission first adopted Form CPOPQR back in 2012 and closely modeled the form on Joint Form PS. The Commission adopted the form of its own volition, unlike Form PF, which is specifically mandated by Dodd-Frank. There is no similar statutory directive requiring the adoption of Form CPO PQR. In my opinion, since its adoption, the detailed information requested on Form CPO PQR has not enhanced the Commission's oversight over CPOs and has never been fully utilized by the staff. I've long questioned the Commission's need to know the litany of data requested on the form. In my view, many of the questions on the existing form were more academic than pragmatic in nature, information that may be nice for the Commission to have, but data that is certainly not necessary for the Commission to effectively oversee commodity pools and the derivatives markets. This is why I'm very pleased that the final rule eliminates the most burdensome sections on the current form. Schedule C and C, which together contain roughly 72 distinct questions, if one includes all the separately identifiable subparts. Many of these questions are challenging for CPOs to calculate precisely and require numerous underlying assumptions that vary from firm to firm, making it difficult, if not impossible, for the Commission to perform an apples-to-apples -apples comparison across the commodity pool industry. While today's final rule represents a market improvement over the current CPO reporting regime, in my view, more work needs to be done. Uh, importantly, the proposal requested comment about reverting back to the former schedule of investments originally adopted by the National Futures Association in 2010 for its NFA form PQR, or what I will refer to as, as the chairman referred to as the 2010 schedule of investments. In 2012, the schedule of investments that the commission adopted in its own rule went much further than the 2010 schedule of investments by lowering the itemized reporting threshold and adding significantly more granular, granular subpart, subcategories of investments. For example, the commission sought information regarding the tranches of various types of securitization and the types of bonds held by the pool. Historically, the information on the schedule of investments has mostly been used by the NFA for their CPO examination program. However, in its comment letter to the Commission, the NFA noted that, quote, it does not have a need for the more granular information currently in the schedule as proposed or as um, originally adopted in 2012. And that, quote, it fully supports aligning the current schedule with the 2010 schedule of investments because NFA believes a more streamlined schedule will significantly alleviate filing burdens on CPOs without negatively impacting the usefulness of the information that is collected. While I had hoped this final rule would amend the form to adopt the 2010 Schedule of Investments, and while it does not, I am encouraged that the preamble, as the Chairman described, instructs DSIO staff to evaluate the ongoing utility of the current Schedule of Investments, including comparing it to the 2010 Schedule of Investments. Within 18 to 24 months, following the compliance date. As part of this review, staff is instructed to consider whether or not, in light of its utility, the Commission should revert back to that 2010 schedule of investments. After completing this review, in whole or in stages, staff will develop recommendations or proposal rulemaking for the Commission's further consideration to effectuate staff's findings. This review will allow staff to carefully consider which questions on the schedule of investments are necessary to effectively oversee CPOs and to propose eliminating any fields which are being received through other data channels or have no regulatory use case to the Commission's oversight function. I think this review is long overdue and is especially timely given the developments in other data streams like Part 45 swap data that DSIO is actively working to combine with clearinghouse data that we receive on futures transactions to provide a complete picture of a CPO's derivatives activity. I believe that DSIO's ability to monitor in real time a fund's derivatives positions will be absolutely vital to the oversight and regulation of commodity pools in the future. And I also like to say that I think there is an important distinction between how we um, monitor 
uh, cash positions and derivatives activity in the futures markets to ensure convergence and the integrity of the futures markets compared to um, our uh, oversight over CPOs to ensure that we're understanding market environments that may pose trouble for some firms to absolutely make sure that they are following their customer protection requirements so that customers can be protected in the event of trouble. I've never believed, and I don't think it is any intent of, um, of the commission or of this form to get into the risk management or trading activity or to dictate from Washington how funds need to uh, be trading and making investments on behalf of their clients. I also have uh, long questioned um, the systemic nature uh, um, of commodity pool operators in isolation uh, and think that uh, that risk would only be transmitted through the banking sector where there are uh, other regulators uh, at play that have uh, detailed information at their disposal. Uh, I think ultimately our oversight over CPOs is focused on consumer protect on customer protection and customer funds protection and disclosure. Uh, and I'm, um, I'm hopeful that this is a positive step in the right direction to ensuring that we receive the information we need to, um, to, uh, to allow our effective oversight in that regard. Uh, so with that, I, was, I would just like to continue um, focusing on the further study of the schedule of investments. Um, um, staff will conduct a complete review of the utility of the data uh, on that schedule. Uh, in my view, 18 to 24 months is a long time to review the usefulness of data that we have been receiving for almost 10 years. And I guess putting aside any judgment on the utility of specific information that's being requested, I would imagine we already have an idea at least of whether or not there are some lie items that we are receiving from other sources and don't need to ask it, ask for it on this form that we receive once, once a quarter and that comes into us well after that quarter has ended. So is it possible for staff's review to occur in stages if DSIO can uh, quickly determine that it already received certain information on the schedule of investments from other data sources, could DSIO act immediately to address uh, that duplicative data collection? And if that's a possibility, um, uh, Director Sterling, could you maybe describe what DSIO, what actions DSIO may take? Well, yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner Quintens, for those remarks, and, and also to you and your team for, for the hard work with us on the school. I think that's a great question. I do think that uh, the staff, uh, as we've talked about with you, uh, are committed, as I am, to working on a thorough review of whether we're getting the right data from the right sources. Um, I think we could look at whether there are other sources besides the schedule of investments that could improve the accuracy, liability, or uh, uh, accuracy and, and availability uh, of the information we need to have a holistic understanding and pursuit of our investor protection and, and market mandates. Um, so I think that uh, if we do find that we can get good information uh, that serves those needs from other sources or in a different way, uh, I always think it's important to get it right, not for any one person or one view to be right. And so we would try to do that, and I think there are ways we could try to do it, whether it's through staff action if permitted, um, or by coming again before the commission for uh, rule or order action. But yes, sir, we're, we're committed to uh, making sure we get, get the right data that we need to carry out our programs and enhance what we can see now from, from market information uh, thanks to our CPO data tool. Yes, thank you, Josh. And I think that you, you, the data tool that you raised um, is, uh, I've had a demonstration of it. Uh, I know that it is being built out. The demonstration I've received so far, I think, is um, uh, shows it to be an excellent resource. I compliment you and your team for thinking of that and pushing forward with it. Um, I, I, I think that that's going to provide um, much more substance and benefit to the commission, the SIO, going forward. Um, as opposed to this form. And I think that that's part of this conversation that we can't just be viewing uh, this form in isolation. We have to always view the entire suite or portfolio of data that we receive as a commission um, uh, to effectuate our regulatory oversight and analyze whether or not it's necessary. 
necessary in each part or in any one instance. Um, and, and I appreciate the turn to this uh, quickly and make uh, any potential modifications or recommendations or take any uh, staff action expeditiously. Um, I think that it's important as soon as the Commission staff finds it receives the same or comparable data from two sources that it takes that action to remedy the, the redundancy and to relieve market participants from any unnecessary reporting obligations. Um, uh, one final question, if I could. Um, when staff is reviewing the schedule of investments to assess the utility of the information requested, uh, I assume it will be considering whether the information requested has utility to the commission itself, uh, that it would not consider whether or not the data could be of interest or use to other agencies? Yes, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. You'll forgive the background noise. I have a flyover helicopter right now. Um, that is correct. The staff, the staff will, will uh, our review will focus uh, whether or not the commission itself needs data on the form to meet our current regulatory needs. And I think that's a key term uh, in the preamble. We're focused on the commission's current regulatory needs. We as a division of the agency are responsible uh, to and accountable to only the commission and its mandates. And that's the purpose for which we would uh, seek to collect that on the form or in any other uh, substitute or different way we may, we may ultimately be able to pilot. Okay, thank you. I think it's important that it refers to the, the, the language in the preamble refers, refers to the commission's use cases and not those by uh, any other agencies. Um, forgive me, I, I had one final question beyond that. Uh, I, I dropped a page here in between, um, uh, if you'll indulge me. Um, Several commenters raised concerns surrounding the cybersecurity of the form and recommended that the commission permit filing with an alphanumeric identifier uh, to conceal the identities of reporting CPOs. Um, obviously, this is very sensitive information. Uh, the commission itself uh, has robust protections in place to protect the data it receives. Um, but basically, commenters are asking for us to separate the filing of the substantive information on the revised form with information that would reveal their identity like an LEI. Um, uh, the preamble notes that staff will continue to review this issue and determine if separate filings are necessary or feasible. Could, would, uh, would you or someone on your team be able to maybe expand upon some of the criteria or factors you would expect the staff to analyze as it considers that possibility? Hi. Uh, so this is Amanda O'Leary. Yes. I apologize. I'm having issues with my camera. Um, That's okay. I can hear so, you, Amanda. Thank you. Okay, good. So it's just going to be a disembodied voice for this answer, unfortunately. Um, so uh, we've, we've had discussions internally about what would be required um, as we work through this process. And, you know, first we would have to have um, discussions with our internal uh, technology team about what changes would have to happen on our end. We would also have to have discussions with NFA regarding changes that would need to happen with respect to their um, program because they are the initial recipients of the data on our behalf. Um, and then once we get the technical, um, or actually we can do this in parallel, but once we get the technical answers, uh, that we need to build out the system, we also need to engage in discussions both with um, the Office of Management and Budget and our colleagues in OGC to determine what um, requirements might apply with respect to the Paperwork Reduction Act and if we would need to get um, a new uh, OMB control number, if we are breaking information into a separate form because we want to make sure that we do that in a legally sound way. But those things can happen in tandem at the same time. Thank you, Amanda. I, I, I think you described that it would be um, uh, complicated and uh, a lot of work, uh, but I commend uh, the division for being willing to continue to look at that, uh, given its importance and the sensitivity of this uh, information um, uh, to the marketplace. Um, so in closing, I'd just like to say I really deeply appreciate um, the work of uh, uh, DSIO and, and this team and you, Director Sterling, for bringing this uh, rule to us uh, in final form today and the improvements in it um, and uh, the division's willingness to, as as the commission should always do, 
uh, reevaluate uh, the usefulness of data that it asks for and that it receives and making sure it's using appropriately. Um, I would uh, uh, I would like to just quickly take the opportunity here, but you said it so eloquently, I'd like to associate myself with, with your remarks. And in closing, I'd like to thank Margo Bailey for my team for her engagement in this role uh, and uh, all the conversations um, uh, that uh, we've, we've had um, on this with, with you and market participants. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to supporting this today. Thank you, Commissioner Quintens. Commissioner Benham. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and um, I want to thank PSIO team, Director Sterling, Elizabeth, Pamela, uh, and Amanda for all of your work with your engagement in my office on this role. I, uh, <clears throat> this uh, today is a culmination of a lot of years of work and advocacy and engagement with market participants. Um, you know, post Dodd Frank, um, we I think as a regulatory community uh, certainly rethought the way we need to um, uh, consider and, and oversee markets, how we need to work with each other better uh, and communicate. And a lot of good things came out of that, certainly. But I think in at least part, today's um, rule is a product of some unintended consequences. And I think uh, a few years of evaluation and, and, and dialogue between the public sector and private sector to figure out uh, what we need to do better uh, to ensure that we're being uh, fair and transparent, uh, but not overly burdensome in what uh, information we collect, both from a, from a, a usefulness case, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, use, use case, which I think is appropriate, and it was good to hear Director Sterling's response that um, from, from his position as Director of DSIO, uh, what we have uh, before us today is, is, is relevant, and there is a use case for the information that we're currently collecting. But Certainly, we're, we continue to learn. Um, we continue to sort of move and evolve with the markets as they change um, and are more technology-driven uh, and ensure that we're not collecting more than we need, protecting the information we have through cyber and other measures, uh, but also making sure that the, the data that we collect is useful in, in our responsibility and our mission. So, um, you know, having been a part of this conversation for, for many, many years, I'm really grateful we're here today and grateful to the staff for putting forward a rule uh, that I think is thoughtful, smart, and above all else, a step in the right direction. And I want to emphasize step. And Josh, if you don't mind, I want to start with a, a question about um, a quote from the preamble, which says, you know, today's final rule constitutes the first of several steps in the Commission's ongoing reassessment of form CPO PQR and the substantive information it seeks to collect and the form and manner in which the commission collects and uses that information. You've, you've said it already, but if you don't, at least in part, if you don't mind, just from your point of view, what, what do you envision as the future? What do you envision as the sort of next steps um, that the division needs to take, that the commission needs to take so that? Yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner, for, for those remarks as well as the question, uh, and thanks, too, to you and your team for working so hard with us on this rule. Um, yeah, I, I honestly believe that, that the right direction we could take could, could lead to many different results or specific tools we would use around the fundamental premise that we do need to understand how funds look over time and what they're doing, not only in the derivatives markets, but using derivatives in relation to other instruments. And I think I can best illustrate that um, with, with an example I alluded to earlier, which is um, there's been press commentary on this. There's ongoing research amongst, I think, all federal financial regulators on um, you know, the March 2020, April 2020 market events uh, and what actors in the market may have led to um, you know, uh, uh, correlation to one uh, amongst, uh, across many asset classes including treasury securities. And there's a relationship between the use of treasury securities, for example, and uh, futures or swaps trading in our markets, basis trading. And um, that's a conversation I should have my, uh, my uh, risk analysts on for, but, but it's just an example of firms were trading treasury futures at that time. Firms were trading or had exposure to treasuries at that time. What's the relationship between those two? What kinds of funds would be in that? And if we can understand what kinds of funds are acting in that market or the oil market or other specific markets where we really have primacy as a regulator, that will be important. I know other regulators, for example, will collect data, portfolio data on a quarterly basis 
for certain kinds of funds, including registered investment companies? Is that information we could lever? Uh, is there other sorts of sources that could give us a, a better picture that are already being produced? So the incremental cost, if it is there, uh, is is um, perhaps not much and, and would be really additive to us. And so I can see a lot of different potential outcomes, but the bottom line is we do need to know what pools are doing more holistically, not only for market protection purposes, but investor protection. Thanks, Josh. That's helpful, and I couldn't agree with you more. You know, we, we continue to learn um, as market events happen, and they will continue to happen, and certainly the March-April period was one of a kind um, in, in many respects and something that I know a lot of uh, work that's been done both within internally the agency but also by market participants. Um, you, you know, the, a lot of what we're doing today in streamlining the forms and making our work more efficient so that we can reduce burdens and, and support um, uh, market participation and liquidity and growth um, uh, has to do with our relationship with NFA and, and fully cognizant of the fact that we need to work very closely with NFA um, so that we're not, again, collecting more information that we need, creating efficiencies uh, and synergies in terms of forms and information that needs to be submitted from the participant side. I think it's helpful for the public to know a little bit about, you know, what's the difference between what NFA does and what we do and what in the information they collect, what is their focus versus what our focus is? Because as much as uh, I think it's in duplication or something that on its face might look uh, uh, inefficient. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner, for that question as well. I do think there are there are different and overlapping use cases for the for the data collected, and and uh, we are in this uh, scenario where there's really two CPOP QRs in one, and ours is a bit more expansive, particularly with the scheduled investments than what NFA has used for going on ten years now. You know, as a designated self-regulatory organization, a membership organization, I think that um, we look to NFA to oversee the registration process for CPOs and other registered firms, uh, and then also to examine them. And when you walk in the door to examine someone, it's pretty helpful to know what, what they're up to. And I also think that NFA has done a commendable job uh, under Tom Sexton's leadership and others there uh, of taking a risk focus in their exam program. They um, can't examine everyone uh, instantaneously or all the time. Many of their registrants, our registrants, their members are um, located overseas, for example, uh, and the fund structures can be complex. So if you can sort of use it for a risk selection tool to conduct an effective examination program for us, that's great. And we certainly see and look to the results of their exams for all registrant categories, including CPS. For us, um, we want to understand that, and we can work and rely on NFA for that. But for us, it's really to understand, um, you know, the registrants themselves and how they interact with each other. So if you're a, quote, buy-side firm, you're an asset manager with funds, you're a CPO with pools, you're introducing liquidity into our markets, you're introducing risk. Uh, and that goes to, in the clear context, a futures commission merchant, uncleared with a dealer, and so there's risk and liquidity transmission. So we want to understand that interaction um, so we can think about what our rules mean because our rules require different things of the people bringing the money in, the people intermediating the transactions that are FCMs, and the folks facilitating trades that can have principal risk like dealers. And so I think understanding the connections with real-time market data as well as pool-specific data uh, can be very helpful to us And then sort of saying, do we have rules that are fully responsive all the way along the chain of registrants involved in trading in these large and dynamic markets. Thanks, Josh. That, that's extremely helpful. And, uh, you know, I think it, it highlights a lot of uh, what I was trying to get at. So I appreciate that, that we do in in many sense, uh, senses share the same um, um, challenges and we seem, share the same sort of missions uh, and the markets obviously are, are the same, but uh, we are unique bodies and we have unique responsibilities and roles and we have to work together, but also understand that um, the information and the, the sort of interaction with the market is unique uh, and that sometimes demands different um, questions to ask and different data that we collect and, and different ways of thinking about um, how to assess risk and how to monitor participation by um, different institutions. Um, uh, I, I want to quickly turn to the, the 
the um, the request from the staff to uh, look at the P, the form PSOI the PSOI information in the revised form and, and thinking about the 2010 scheduled investments and, and the 2018 to 24 month uh, staff um, evaluation. What I think one question, and I think this is the right thing to do. I support it. Um, this really goes to the heart of what I was saying earlier, um, that we need to be constantly evaluating and overlooking uh, what we collect and why we're collecting it. Does this, from your perspective, uh, Josh, from a division standpoint, pose any challenges from a resource perspective? Um, are you going to be able to do this? And, and I have to commend you on the new the, the tool you have. I was able to sort of demo it a few weeks ago, it really is great. And I think it's a step forward uh, in so many respects for us to be able to fulfill our responsibilities. But um, certainly staff, and, and you know this as well as anyone, extremely busy and in and, and, and doing the day-to-day -day business of the, the division. Are, are resources an issue at all uh, in your mind for, for conducting this review over the next uh, year or two? Well, thank you for that. It's, it's a great question, and uh, we're always mindful of the staff. And, and before I get into that, I just want to give a quick shout out to Howard Rosen and John Rogers and our data technology office because they they helped build the darn tool, uh, as well as my team here who did that. So thanks to them. But um, it is a game changer. Uh, but yeah, I think we do have the resources. It is important focus for us. I think we continue to have. Uh, improved and improving technology resources that make things a lot easier for us. There's a lot of buy-in to look at it. And I think it gets to an, an important point, which is we want to be in a position always to be able to tell the commission if they need to do something. And I think this is a first step uh, to simplify the form of maintain. So I do think it will remain important to us and uh, we will continue to make it a focus and we will we'll have, we do indeed have the right sources to do it and the right people under the right leadership with Amanda O'Lear to do it. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. Um, last question, and this might be for your team, uh, but certainly take a stab if, if, uh, if it's for you. The final rule that we're voting on eliminates uh, the ability of a duly regulated CPO to rely on the joint form PF as a substitute um, for filing uh, CPO PQR. Um, and when this was proposed, the commission expressed concerns that some data streams on commodity pools that are not private funds, um, currently reported solely via form PF, would be lost. Uh, and there was a question in the NPRM about this um, and whether or not there would be some lost data for these specific pools on the PF, the form PF. Can you describe, or members of your team, the, the types of responses we got and, and what your expectations are? Um, after we, we uh, as it seems, we will support and finalize this rule um, shortly. Hi, so this is Amanda again, still having issues with my camera. Um, so the commenters did note that it was a very real possibility that um, some of them may uh, stop including their commodity pools that they otherwise would have included in their form PF filings. They may stop doing that. Um, I would note that that would require um, a certain amount of system changes in order to, to stop that reporting. And so it's not entirely clear how many entities would in fact cease reporting um, on Form PF rather than just continuing to allow their systems to operate as they have been. Um, but that being said, we expect that that loss of data would be um, small. Uh, and that the benefits of aligning form CPO PQR with NFA's PQR uh, outweigh, outweigh that loss, that potential loss, um, because, again, I would note that Form PF was designed for um, a specific subset of funds that Dodd-Frank defines as private funds, and those commodity pools that would be included do not in and of themselves meet that definition. And so they were not technically funds that were of the type that were contemplated to be reported on that form to begin with. Thanks, Amanda. That's, that's great to hear. And I appreciate that sort of cost benefit uh, analysis there, sort of looking at the, the greater um, good and the larger goal that we're trying to capture. And, and I agree and support with that. Um, I'll make one last uh, comment, Mr. Chairman, is 
and Josh, I think you, you, you noted this and if, feel free to respond if you want. I don't think we, we differ per se on it, but um, you know, you mentioned the, the responsibility of our agency to collect data, um, to analyze, surveil information, and to act as necessary within the context of our statute and our mission and our responsibility, which I agree 110%. Uh, but, you know, we should also be mindful of our responsibilities with respect to um, the Financial Stability Oversight Council and what we're going to be later voting on with uh, the MOU with the Office of Financial Research also within Treasury. Uh, and I just make those points because as much as we have to be very um, disciplined in uh, our work and, and what we do and how we do it and our interaction with um, our stakeholders um, uh, in, in the context of our statute, we do have other responsibilities as they relate with coordination with other agencies and other government bodies that look at market data and look at market risk and financial stability um, differently and uniquely than what we do and what we're uh, required to do. So um, I agree as much as we're, we're uh, required and, and, and our statute demands that we focus on our stakeholders uh, and our markets. Um, you know, the Congress is, has requested that we also use the data that we collect and, and you know, view it differently, share it with others uh, in a thoughtful way, in a way that protects, obviously, um, uh, uh, IP and proprietary information, um, but also um, looks at macro and holistic issues that uh, would protect our economy and our financial market. So just wanted to point that out. And again, thanks to the team. I think this is really a great day here. And uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this rule up and, and Director Sterling for your work and uh, the entire team. Uh, because again, as I said, this has been uh, many years in, in, the, in uh, the making. Uh, and it's a step in the right direction, uh, but I would just emphasize to uh, our stakeholders, it's one step. Uh, we certainly will continue, I know, to do more work if it's necessary to work with you and to make additional changes uh, to ensure safe and transparent markets that protect customers um, and also re reduce burdens uh, where it's possible. So thanks again, and I look forward to supporting this. And like I said, uh, at the onset, I'll have a statement to post to the website uh, very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Stump. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I fear that Commissioner Quintens and Commissioner Benham have made many of the points that I think we all we all must be on the same page because we share many of the same same thoughts. But I'll try to take it in a little different direction. So um, I, I've made the point that I support the many improvements we're making to better tailor form CPO PQR, and I don't want to in any way minimize those enhancements. But like Commissioner Quintin, I wish we had also adopted a similar, more tailored approach to the schedule of investments. Um, the schedule of investments required in today's form, CPO PQR, is considerably more detailed than the former version as it was updated by the National Futures Association in 2010. So if you all will indulge me for a minute, I want to talk specifically about some of those parameters. So the 2010 NFA form collected information on broad topic categories. But the CFTC schedule of investments is much more detailed, and you've discussed a need for a holistic view, um, Director Sterling and Chairman Carbert, um, a more holistic view into the vast activities. But the schedule of investments currently includes multiple responses within categories such as residential real estate, commercial real estate, unlisted equities, fixed income notes, on bills and approximately 60 line items regarding asset-backed securities, including securitization and resecuritization of commercial, residential, agency, CDO, CLO, credit cards, and auto loan classified as senior, mezzanine, or junior equity. So I'd just be curious to know, and, and it's not a gotcha question, I, I, I'm genuinely curious to know what, if any, analysis the Commission staff has completed in the years since we've been collecting this information um, from these portions of the firm? Commissioner Stump, I want to thank you for, um, uh, for two things, for the question, of course, uh, and, and certainly for the hard work that you personally and your team have put into this issue with us. I know uh, we share a common cause about being smart about data. Uh, and, and we're fully supportive of your efforts there. And to your question, I think that um, uh, as to what the staff has done historically with the data, 
in those subcategories over time uh, would happen precisely before uh, our arrival as an executive team. I, I don't know for certain, but my impression coming in and looking at the situation is that the data were not fully taken advantage of. Uh, I think there are reasons for that. I think um, reasons of uh, budget and, and resource allocation and other priorities that the commission had. Um, and maybe I'm biased because I, I was a funds lawyer before I showed up here, but I, I thought it was pretty gosh darn important. And I, I'm fortunate that uh, the chairman, um, given his broader perspective on financial markets and, and the commissioners as well, uh, agree. And so having said that, um, I think that there can be a strong use case for us to understand the interplay of derivatives usage by funds and those subcategories, I, if I would, I read in, in the papers, it's true, the financial papers about the CMBS market, uh, the private lending market, things like that. It'll be important for us to focus on those things. I cannot tell you uh, with, with a, uh, a sufficient degree of certainty what exactly we'll do on that, but it's something we need to be mindful of, both as an agency and as, as contributing to uh, FSOC and supporting the work we're doing now in IOSCO, we need to uh, be able to look at those kinds of things. But importantly, I can't tell you that that's always going to be true or there isn't a better way to get at it or that maybe someday we don't need that information. And that's why I think it's important we have the commitment to work hard over the next uh, 18 to 24 months to focus on things like this so that we are in a better position to recommend to the commission Commission action we have confidence in. We were absolutely confident that these changes that we proposed, which are admittedly incremental um, back in April, were the right ones. We're pleased, it seems, that, that uh, the commission uh, agrees with us. And uh, we want to keep doing that. So I think we, uh, we can get there. Um, I'm not quite sure precisely how things are used now. I could foresee a use case, but we're always looking at the best way to do things. I hope, I hope that, that gets to uh, your, your question and concern, Commissioner. Thank you for that, Josh. And and, and um, I also like to, you know, to hypothetically explore what next steps could be taken is analyzing the schedule of investments and, and these more granular details that are in, in some regards outside of our direct um, oversight jurisdiction. What if in analyzing those we found something troubling? And um, if, depending on our ability to discern such risks, the commission were to identify a concerning trend, either across CPOs or a holding of a particular pool, what official action could the commission or staff take in response? Yes, thank you for that. So I think that, that um, uh, Commissioner, that, that what we would be looking for in that context is um, an impact for us on our markets or our registrants. And so necessarily, if there is information on, on movements in the cash market or something we we're observing over time in this form, which is quarterly, we'd want to understand the interaction in the derivative space. And we can we could suggest to the commission uh, an information call where we require registrants to provide us with supplemental data. Um, we could work with NFA to go out and examine on specific issues. Um, we could issue an advisory or commission a report. Um, many number of things we could do. Um, again, though, uh, and importantly, there would have to be a connection to our markets, thinking about market impact. Uh, for investors, um, we have to think about investor impact. And so we, we've put out some advisories from the division over the last six to nine months focusing on, um, you know, understanding commodity pool investing. We did that in, in uh coordination with Michael Short in the Public Affairs Office, which was great. And also just on financial innovation, we have issued advisors in that space, including with respect to pool investment, to drive home those messages. Uh, and in those cases, you know, there was definitely cash market investing alongside derivatives investing. So we could pursue many different vectors. I will be the first to tell you, I think, that, that in looking at that kind of thing and looking for emerging issues, a quarterly reporting form would probably not be the first place we would look, um, but it would be additive to things we're doing, like with our CPO data tool and information we can get from other places. Thank you. And, and I just want to be clear, I could support the expanded schedule of investments if, in fact, it had proven essential to our regulatory responsibilities, um, but I'm not sure that, that we've accomplished much with the information to date. Um, so in my view, the continued collection of the more granular data from the schedule, invest, schedule of investments 
as it is represents a, a bit of a dislocation between data wants and data needs. Um, so I'm a little bit disappointed that we were not able to implement all of the changes I had desired, which would have included reverting to the 2010 version of the schedule of investments. Um, I will anxiously await um, the staff's evaluation of any ongoing utility of the more granular schedule of investments as well as their recommendations or even proposed rulemaking based upon those findings. And I hope we'll be able to revisit the schedule of investments in a timely manner, maybe even sooner than the period of review provided for um, in the rule. Uh, with that, that concludes my question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Berkovitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so like Commissioner Stump, this uh, um, discussion has been very informative. Uh, many of my uh, questions have been um, asked and answered, and the discussion has been very useful. So I'll, I'll try to not be repetitive, but uh, for, forgive me if I am. Um, Director Sterling, um, we, we've been talking about the, the, the schedule of, in, of investments and and its expansive nature, but it also does it not provide us with direct information about commodity pools that are acting in our in our space. For example, I think you mentioned the the events of earlier this year, the March or March or April. We had an April event in the oil market. And does the information on schedule investments have uh, provide us with useful information regarding you know pools that may have been participating? Um, in, and have uh, positions that are, are relevant to our understanding of, of that market. Um, could you uh, just concretely say what on this form regarding the oil market would have aided us or possibly could have aided us um, in understanding the events or who was in the market and, and some of the significant players in the market uh, on, on that event uh, this year? Yes, Mr. Commissioner, thank you for that question. Um, I, I do think there's information in the form that can be helpful for that as we formulate policy responses uh, and, and certainly uh, informational responses uh, to go to market uh, market participants like commodity pool investors. And so to take an example, um, it would be helpful for us to know, and the form does tell us, you know, which firms invested in oil during that time, and, and when they did, who their brokers might have been, futures commission merchants or their swap dealers. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to understand one quarter to the next, how their exposures might have changed, and then to to take that information along with our market data tool, and then understand the disclosures that those funds were making, whether they were um, uh, boilerplate disclosures about risks attendant to investing in a particular market, oil, Gold, really, any anything in March and April, I suppose, um, uh, and then sort of review those disclosures, uh, and then you know provide either commentary to the registered firms or helpful public guidance uh, to investors, or perhaps both, um, uh, so that we can make sure that we have a firm understanding of the shifts in trading around that time from a historical perspective. One, vis-a-vis -vis our registered firms, and two, vis-a-vis -vis the public whether we feel like they're getting good, continuous, updated information. In fact, our Part 4 rules, uh, I believe, and the team will correct me if I'm wrong, require a disclosure document to be uh, updated to reflect a change, uh, any material change within 21 days or you can't use it anymore, and that means you have to stop offering shares in your fund. So um, it's really important for us to understand that disclosures are being made and updated and maintained um, in that regard, because we have a rule that says it has to be done. So I think it is, it can be quite useful to us, sir. Sir, you may be on mute. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Got it. Um, so for a fund that's invested, say, in, in real estate, uh, residential mortgages, commercial mortgages, does that have any relevance to uh, how is that particularly relevant to what what we may be interested in uh, rather than just well we, there's a need for the federal government to know this but does it affect um, if, if they're if they're involved in residential mortgages does that implicate their potential use of derivatives uh, interest rate 
derivatives or, 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 or whatever. So are, the, are those asset class investments relevant to our markets? Yes, Mr. Commissioner, I think they certainly can be. Um, you know, any, any debt-based or borrowing-based uh, investment strategy often requires hedging of, of things like duration and, as you say, rate risk. And, and so there would be a heavy usage of derivatives there, and there would be an exposure uh, from a swap dealer, say, to that, to that commodity pool uh, in terms of payments on the swap that may become due, and those payments could be accelerated uh, in, in uh, an event of default or something under the terms of the swap. And so it's useful to understand connections like that. One, two, um, you know, we have to think about um, what that, what a abrupt shift in a cash market like that could mean for the investment manager as a whole. We don't have a recovery regime, a bankruptcy regime for, for asset managers. They're not subject to a capital requirement. I don't think that they necessarily ought to be, but we need to understand that some violent market activities can put those firms out of business, and there will be implications for other registrants we have and the investors in the funds, and the fund investors assume the risk, but it's worth knowing these things, and I do think that, that it can be an important tool for being a helpful regulator in times of stress. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to commend you and, and your team uh, for... Um, taking on to improve the data quality and, and the use of this data. I, I think it's a, real, it's a really important effort, um, and uh, I fully support um, what you've been doing and going forward as well to make this data useful. Uh, I, I agree with my colleagues. We should not be collecting useless data. We should only be collecting data that we use. Uh, it's a burden on our systems, and it's a burden on the market participants uh, who have to report data. We should only be collecting that which is useful. And so I'm supporting this rule today. Um, at, at the same time, none of this is static in, in terms of what's useful, what's not useful. Some data is, is outdated, and also as we go along, we may decide we need more data, too. Uh, it's, it's not a one-way street of just reducing data requirements as we go forward. Sometimes we might find that we need additional data. And so I want, just want to follow up uh, uh, on um, something uh, that, was, that was mentioned earlier, and, and that's the LEIs and, and the LEI requirement. Um, and it, it, the LEI requirement is in the swaps market, uh, uh, but not, not for the futures. And um, I gather this creates, uh, and the rule has been fashioned uh, with that recognition uh, in uh, with that recognition. So just if you could, uh, uh, you or one of the team members could explain the LEI situation, that LEI is only on the swap side, it's not on the future side, whether it would be helpful on the future side and, and uh, or to integrate the swaps data and the futures data. I guess the LEI is, is one, conceptually it seems like a straightforward way to be able to integrate our swaps data with our futures data. Um, could you um, or, or the team um, expand on that, and what are the challenges, or is that the only way of doing it, or are there other ways of doing it? There's lots of reporting systems on the future side. We have exchange reporting, uh, and, and there, there's many challenges that our division market oversight has in, in getting reporting on the future side into our system. So is, is this just a yet another layer of, of, of reporting issues that we have to deal with, or but you've, you've identified a need here as to how to integrate our swaps data with our futures data. So could you expand on that and, and the efforts that you see going forward about, about doing that? Yes, happy to do that, Mr. Commissioner, and, and thank you for that question. Uh, we identified uh, an LEI number that could be associated with a specific commodity pool as a, as a definite data need. And here's why. It's an important data element for us to sort of tie um, you know, which fund is the counterparty to a dealer on a trade. And for some concatenation of events that's beyond my grasp technologically, um, that was not flowing through to us even when we began to design our CPO data tool. Fortunately, for futures trading, we're able to sort of make those connections based on market data that our division of market oversight has historically collected and we have access to. And so we can understand through an account controller framework for futures trading 
who the um, who the CPO is and then what funds the trading might be in. We could not do that with the swap data repository or SDR reporting or swaps on a pool specific level. And so we discussed the matter with the National Futures Association who facilitates reporting for us and identified that if we were able to do that through this, this PQR mechanism, not only would it be useful to us for sort of historical quarterly look backs on swap market relationships, but also it would be important to us as an input for our CPO data tool. And, you know, to the extent the form continues to be used and refreshed and new pools are identified within LEI, this will be very helpful to us. It'll help us have a more composite picture of things. And, you know, over time, we might find a better way to get to an LEI, but this, based on where we are now, with the technology and the overall framework, made the most sense to us. Is there, is there, a, need, is there a need uh, to... I mean, are you able to fully integrate your swaps and your futures data with the, the, the various systems, LEI on the swap side and the systems that you've described on the future side? To get a holistic picture of a pool, if you have um, we will be in a position to do that shortly. We have a plan to do it, but having the LEI will get us there. I think we can marry the futures data uh, to pools right now. Um, the swaps data, it's a little bit more of a challenge in the LEI. Getting it from the fund side will really marry it for us. We do not need, I should say, sorry for not mentioning this earlier, we don't need the LEI for any purpose on the future side. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I just, again, uh, thank you and, and the team. Your, uh, your work on, on this rule um, and working uh, with my office uh, on the various uh, uh, questions and comments we had on the rule. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd ask that all the commissioners now uh, go back on video uh, so I can ask whether the commissioners are prepared to vote. Everyone is, seems to be nodding their head yes. Uh, so with that, could I ask Mr. Kirkpatrick if you could please call the roll for the motion to adopt the final rule amending the compliance requirements for CPOs on form CPO PQR. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The motion now before the commission is on the adoption of the final rule amending the compliance requirements for CPOs on form CPO PQR. Commissioner Berkovitz. Commissioner Berkovitz votes aye. Commissioner Berkovitz votes aye. Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Stump votes aye. Commissioner Stump votes aye. Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Benham votes aye. Commissioner Benham votes aye. Commissioner Quintens. Commissioner Quintens votes aye. Commissioner Quintens votes aye. Chairman Tarbert. Chairman Tarbert votes aye. Chairman Tarbert votes aye. Mr. Chairman, on this matter, the ayes have five, the noes have zero. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. The ayes have it, and the motion to adopt the final rule is hereby approved. Uh, thank you all very much. Our second agenda item is uh, to recognize and sign a memorandum of understanding between the CFTC in the Office of Financial Research regarding the sharing of data and information collected on Form CPO PQR. At this time, I'd like to welcome the following staff for their presentation. From the Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight, we have Amanda O'Lear and Andre Goldsmith. From the Office of General Counsel, we have Natasha Coates, our Deputy General Counsel, and Matt Rowland, our Assistant General Counsel. Before the presentation begins, I also want to take an opportunity to thank many of the people that worked on this particular project. From DSIO, Pamela Garrity, who we heard from earlier, and from the Office of General Counsel, also Dan Davis, our General Counsel, and Anthony Hayes, our Counsel. And then finally, from the Office of Financial Research, I want to give particular thanks to the efforts of Valerie Wells, Senior Counsel. So with that, I will hand the floor over to uh, Andre, Natasha, Amanda, and Matthew. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. 
Uh, this is Amanda O'Lear, and it is my privilege to begin the presentation on the Memorandum of Understanding between the Commission and the Office of Financial Research with respect to the sharing of data collected on form CPOPQR. This has been a month-long undertaking involving staff in DSIO, OGC, and at OFR, and truly has been an extraordinary effort on the part of staff to bring this agreement to fruition. I will now turn the presentation over to Andre Goldsmith, Special Counsel in DSIO. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to present the Memorandum of Understanding between the Commission and the Office of Financial Research regarding the sharing of information collected on form CPO-PQR. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Commission's Office of General Counsel for their support and assistance in finalizing this MOU. I would also like to thank our colleagues at OFR for their commitment to working with us to develop this MOU and for their cooperation during the negotiation process. Um, I'd just like to start with a bit of background in OFR. OFR was established in the Dodd-Frank Act as an office within the U.S. Department of the Treasury. OFR is, by statute, charged with supporting the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSAC, and FSAC member agencies by, among other things, collecting data on behalf of the FSAC uh, and providing such data to the FSAC and to FSAC member agencies. OFR also performs research. In terms of its research function, OFR's charge includes monitoring, investigating, and reporting on risks to the financial stability of the United States, conducting, coordinating, and sponsoring research to improve regulation of financial entities and markets, investigating and reporting findings related to disruptions and failures in the financial market, and making recommendations to the FSAC based on its findings, and also conducting studies and providing advice on the impact of policies related to systemic risk. OFR has requested the data collected on Form CPO-PQR in order to carry out its functions consistent with the Dodd-Frank Act. Turning to the MOU itself, the execution of an MOU with OFR covering Form CPO-PQR data has long been a goal of the Commission. When Form CPO-PQR was originally adopted back in 2012, one of the Commission's stated objectives was to facilitate a collection of data that would assist the FSAC in the event that the FSAC requested and the Commission provided the data collected on Form CPO-PQR. Despite this intention, however, and due at least in part to some of the challenges with the original Form CPO-PQR as described in the rulemaking adopted today, the Commission has not provided Form CPO-PQR data to the FSAC or to OFR. In conjunction with the Commission's efforts to reassess the scope of Form CPO-PQR earlier this year, Commission staff renewed negotiations with OFR regarding an MOU that would cover the sharing of data collected on Form CPO-PQR. With the adoption of the amended Form CPO-PQR, Commission staff believe that now is an appropriate time to formalize the mutual understanding of the Commission and of OFR with respect to the terms that will govern the sharing the sharing of such data. The Information Sharing MOU thus sets forth a framework for sharing CPO PQR data with OFR that provides the necessary protections for the data while at the same time allowing OFR to use the data in carrying out its statutory responsibilities and functions. The Commission's intention is to share both historical and ongoing form CPO PQR data pursuant to the MOU. With respect to ongoing data, the Commission has agreed to provide OFR with all data that is submitted on Form CPO-PQR on a going-forward basis, as that form has been revised pursuant to today's rulemaking. With respect to historical data, the Commission has agreed to provide OFR all historical data from the same schedules and fields that exist on Form CPO-PQR as it has been revised today. The information that the Commission intends to share with OFR pursuant to the MOU, is consistent with information that OFR already receives on a regular basis from the SEC. Specifically, the SEC provides OFR with the data collected on Form PS, a form jointly adopted by the Commission and the SEC, which is required to be filed by CPOs that are duly registered as investment advisors with the SEC. 
The provision of form CPO PQR data to OFR thus will complement the form PF data already shared with OFR. As my colleagues noted in their presentation of the final rule, Commission staff believe that the amendment to form CPO PQR will produce a more streamlined and focused data collection regarding registered CPOs and their operated pools. For example, the Commission will collect and subsequently provide to OFR under the terms of the MOU information regarding a CPO's pools, monthly rates of return, net asset value, and service providers, including the pools, trading managers, and custodians. Commission staff are confident that the data collected on revised form CPO PQR will be helpful to OFR and the SBOC in carrying out their statutory responsibilities and functions. I will now turn it over to my colleagues in the Office of General Counsel to continue the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to all of the commissioners. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today, and I'd like to thank you for giving the Office of the General Counsel this opportunity to discuss the Memorandum of Understanding between the Commission and the Office of Financial Research, or OFR, regarding the sharing of information collected on Form CPO PQR. I will briefly discuss the relationship between the Form CPO PQR Information Sharing MOU and the 2011 Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC MOU. I will then turn things over to my colleague, Matt Rowland, who will discuss the applicable use, handling, and disclosure restrictions set forth in the Form CPO PQR Information Sharing MOU. The FSOC MOU was entered into between the FSOC member agencies in 2011. That MOU describes the understanding of the parties with respect to the treatment of non-public information obtained from or shared among the parties in connection with or related to the functions and activities of the Dodd-Frank Act. The Commission, OFR, and the FSOC are parties to the FSOC MOU. The MOU covering form CPO PQR data and information is intended to complement the existing FSOC MOU. There are some distinctions, distinctions between the form CPO PQR information sharing MOU and the FSOC MOU that are relevant here, however. First, Although the existing FSOC MOU covers the treatment of non-public information obtained from or shared among the parties in connection with the activities of the FSOC or OFR, that MOU makes no distinction between work product and non-public information. The form CPO PQR information sharing MOU, by contrast, differentiates the treatment of form CPO PQR information and form CPO PQR work product. It defines form CPO PQR work product to include, for example, an OFR or FSOC analysis, study, research paper, or other work products that include or are derived from form CPO PQR information that is shared or received under the MOU. A second distinction between the 2011 FSOC MOU and today's form CPO PQR information sharing MOU is that the FSOC MOU does not make any provision for the publication of sufficiently aggregated, anonymized, or otherwise masked work product. In contrast, the Form CPO PQR Information Sharing MOU articulates the requirements that must be satisfied before such aggregated, anonymized, or otherwise masked work product may be made public. Lastly, the FSOC MOU does not explicitly reference the use handling, and other related restrictions under the Commodity Exchange Act. The Form CPO PQR Information Sharing MOU, however, is tailored to the specific circumstances of the Form CPO PQR Information and Related Work Product. Thus, the MOU describes the safeguards that are necessary to protect confidential Form CPO PQR Information and Form CPO PQR Work Product in a manner that adheres to the statutory requirements in Section 8. The legal foundation that underpins each of these distinctions will be expounded upon further by my colleague, Matt Rowland. Before I hand things over to Matt, though, I'd like to thank DSIO staff, including Andre Goldsmith and Amanda O'Lear, for their hard work on this endeavor. I also extend sincere appreciation to OGC attorneys Matt Rowland and Anthony Hayes and General Counsel Dan Davis. I will now turn things over to Matt Rowland to continue the presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Natasha. Uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, as you've heard, there are a couple of aspects of this new MOU that differ from the FSOC MOU. And as Natasha mentioned, I'll speak a bit more about the legal foundation for two of those distinctions and how this new MOU ensures compliance with Section 8 of the Commodity Exchange Act. First, as Natasha noted, Paragraph 1 of the MOU draws a distinction between raw data and work product. The FSOC MOU defines non-public information to include data or information provided by a party thereto, including the Commission, and any document to the extent that contains such information, which would include work product based on or derived from that information. Here, uh, this new MOU defines a separate category of work product in order to facilitate the subsequent publication by OFR of work product that it creates based on the raw data it receives from the CFTC pursuant to this MOU. I'll address this publication issue in more detail momentarily. Uh, notably, other than allowing for potential publication of form CPO PQR work product, the restrictions imposed by this MOU on form CPO PQR information and work product are identical. Specifically, paragraph 3C of the MOU describes both the allowed uses and the restrictions imposed. This paragraph allows OFR to share both raw data and work product with its own staff, uh, with FSOC and its staff, and with FSOC member agencies and their staff who are working on FSOC or OFR matters on a need-to-know basis for the purpose of performing their official work duties consistent with applicable law. Collectively, these potential recipients of raw data and work product are defined as authorized recipients. FSOC and FSOC member agencies are not being asked to sign the Form CPO PQR Information Sharing MOU. However, as Natasha explained, the existing FSOC MOU, which they have all signed, uh, remains in force with respect to these agencies and their staff. And moreover, this new form uh, CPO PQR information sharing MOU provides that OFR must advise all authorized recipients of the terms of this new MOU and that as a condition of receiving information or work product, they must be bound by and instructed to comply with the terms of the new Form CPO PQR Information Sharing MOU. And the new MOU further clarifies that authorized recipients may not share information or work product with any person who is not an authorized recipient or otherwise uh, they may not disclose such information or work product. So, I just want to uh, note as a reminder here that in addition to the protections contained in this new MOU and in the existing FSOC MOU, Section 8E of the Quantity Exchange Act, uh, pursuant to which the Commission is sharing the Form CPO PQR information, contains mandatory language restricting any department or agency to which the Commission furnishes information from disclosing such information except in a limited set of circumstances, which includes any action or proceeding under the laws of the United States to which it, the Commission, or the United States is a party, and that would apply uh, to OFR here. With respect to publication by OFR of work product that includes or is derived from the raw data provided under the new MOU, paragraph 3D of the MOU allows OFR to publish such work product, but only where all the raw data contained in the work product is sufficiently aggregated, anonymized, or otherwise masked in order to prevent the identification of the business tra transactions or market positions of any person or trade secrets or names of customers, uh, and where the CFTC has been provided with a copy of the work product in advance and gives its consent in writing that the work product can be publicly disclosed in accordance with the uh, requirements of Section 8A and E of the Commodity Exchange Act. In this way, the CFTC can ensure uh, that any market-sensitive or otherwise confidential information it provides to OFR is appropriately protected from disclosure while still enabling OFR to fulfill its mission. Uh, I'll note here that the CFTC in all cases reserves the right to ensure that publication of work product is consistent with the requirements of Section 8 of the Commodity Exchange Act and in the public interest. 
when the CFTC provides its written consent to publication by OFR of its work product, it is the CFTC is exercising its authority pursuant to Section 8A to publish general statistical information of interest to the public. And the restrictions in Section 8E that I mentioned earlier uh, no longer apply to that mass data. Uh, so I'm going to stop the presentation there, and I want to just thank you for the opportunity to discuss the legal underpinnings of Form CPO PQR information sharing and you. Thank you. Thank you very much to the entire team that worked on this. And, and let me just say the Dodd-Frank Act, as was mentioned earlier, established the OFR nearly a decade ago, actually more than a decade ago, uh, to shine a light on dark corners of the financial systems where they... Uh, and OFR's principal role is to support the Financial Stability Oversight Council, of which I'm a member, so we can make important decisions regarding the financial system. Now, in carrying out its important mission, it was always contemplated and directed by Congress that OFR would have access to data from other U.S. financial regulators, including the CFTC. Yet to date, nearly 10 years later, we've shared none of the form CPO PQR data with the OFR. Now, admittedly, this was largely because a number of things, but our shortcomings in the data itself, we've been collecting information that has been discussed that, that we really haven't used from form CPO PQR. And obviously, in Washington, it takes some time for two federal regulators to, to get together and negotiate something of this magnitude. The good news is, is today's final rule that we just passed unanimously rectifies the shortcomings in the old version of CPO PQR making the data finally usable. And so that allows us uh, to, 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 to enter into this MOU with uh, the OFR. Um, so I'm very pleased, and, and I'm not going to go over the, the legal discussion, but we, we had our lawyers come on uh, just so we could reassure the public uh, that the, any information transferred to OFR, which is another federal regulatory, another federal agency uh, underneath the United States Treasury, will be protected. Um, I'm pleased that today with us to sign the MOU alongside myself is none other than Director of OFR, Dino Falaschetti. Uh, Dino, uh, welcome to the CFTC. It's an honor to have you with us. Could you please proceed and make your statement? Uh, likewise, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Commissioners, as well. Uh, following my confirmation, our Office of Financial Research initiated an all-staff effort to fulfill our Dodd-Frank responsibilities. While our mission is simple, it is incredibly important. That is, further financial stability through high-quality financial data, standards, and analysis, principally in support of the Financial Stability Oversight Council and its members. Our signing of today's Memorandum of Understanding fulfills an important part of that mandate by ratifying an agreement that was years in the making. OFR monitors and analyzes both potential and realized stressors in financial markets and institutions with the objective of clarifying the cause and extent of any associated vulnerabilities. Our office plays a complementary role in supporting financial stability, which is always important, and especially so during these last few months. As COVID-related disruptions evolve, our data products continue to provide timely indicators of financial stress. Today's agreement provides our office access to data reported on Form CPO PQR with the objective of gaining informative insights to activities and risks of CFTC registered commodity pool operators. The revised form will increase transparency about the size, risk, and monthly returns of CPOs and thus complement OFR's consistent efforts to monitor the private fund space while furthering our office's capacity to support FSOC and its member agencies. Finally, the collaboration between OFR and the CFTC helps implement a recommendation from the FSOC 2019 annual report 
that relevant agencies continue to review the available data on private funds to assess whether and how private funds may pose a risk to financial stability. Thank you, Chairman Tarbert, for your initiative in spearheading the considerable efforts that have brought us to this signing ceremony. It would not have happened without your terrific leadership. And I'm incredibly proud of the dedication and consistent efforts of our office staff members to further financial stability, and in doing so, further economic opportunity for America and Americans. With that, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you so much, Director Falaschetti. Uh, now, I think we can go ahead and sign the MOU. The MOU is for making this important data sharing arrangement possible. Well, now I would like to give my fellow commissioners an opportunity to make closing statements. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Berkovitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, all the staff uh, at the CFTC for their, for their hard work uh, on both of the items before us today uh, on the CPO uh, PQR uh, rule, um, Josh, Elizabeth, Pamela, and Amanda, and, and that team are working with uh, me and, and uh, Lucy Hines in my office and, and um, uh, the entire commission uh, on a number of the issues that we've discussed today. I think it was a very productive effort uh, and uh, uh, results in, in a, um, a collegial um, uh, uh, process and uh, um, the unanimous support of that rule. So I want to thank um, Yes, I also want to thank uh, all the uh, the team that worked on the uh, uh, MOU um, uh, for also assisting my office, uh, working uh, to uh, enable us to understand the MOU uh, and uh, refine some of the provisions in there uh, to enable its signing uh, today with o OFR. And I, I welcome the director of OFR to our, our, our meeting today. Uh, so I just want to thank the entire staff uh, and uh, your office and my, my uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and, and my fellow uh, co colleagues on, on the commission for their efforts. Uh, uh, another day uh, where we've uh, uh, advanced the public interest. At this moment, uh, I'd also like to um, express my appreciation to uh, Jamie McDonald uh, for the service that he um, has provided to uh, the CFTC. And, and, and the entire country in uh, leading the Division of Enforcement um, for the past uh, between two and three years, maybe it's about three years now. Uh, so um, uh, we had a very successful year um, in, in 2020 uh, that was just concluded, the, the fiscal year, uh, uh, many uh, successful results. Um, and uh, I want to express my appreciation to Jamie and the entire Division of Enforcement for those efforts, uh, and I wish Jamie well uh, on his uh, future endeavors. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Commissioner Berkovitz. Commissioner Stump. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm just going to take the opportunity for um, to utilize my closing statement to briefly comment on data protection because I enjoy talking about it so much. Um, and all of you know it's of a particular priority for me. So I'd, I'd like to associate myself with some comments that Commissioner Berkovitz made earlier in which he correctly pointed out that our data intake needs are constantly changing. And we, we should not um, be reluctant to collect the data that we have determined is, is critical to fulfilling our regulatory mission. We likely collect more data today than at any point in prior in the agency's history. And as such, I believe it's never been more important to balance our responsibility to be data-driven while also prioritizing protecting the requisite data. So that is why I believe the CFTC itself should strive to only collect the information that we know has a demonstrable use case. And therefore, I would also expect that other agencies seeking the information we are entrusted to protect, to offer a precise utility specific to their responsibilities, and perhaps a bit more granular than broad missions as the justification for the data they request of us. 
I know as officers of the United States government, we all recognize the obligation to remain vigilant and safeguarding the data we collect, especially sensitive, proprietary, and personally identifiable information, such as that that's contained in Form CPO PQR. And in the case of this commission, Congress has left very little room for interpretation as to our obligations to do so under Section 8 of the Commodity Exchange Act. Our adherence to these requirements has never been more critical than in the current environment, where data is increasingly important to the market and the regulators, and most especially in light of the agency's coordination role within the FSOC. With that, Mr. Chairman, I too would like to thank the teams that worked on, on these rules. I am, I'm, I've been very pleased to support the update to the forum today, um, and I also want to thank the Office of the General Counsel for time they've spent with me over the course of the past few days discussing the um, legal parameters around data sharing. So thank you all very much, and I hope everyone has a nice afternoon. Thank you, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Benham. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, I want to um, thank Director Palaschetti for joining us, and I'll start with uh, some comments on, on the MOU. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for following through. You made a lot of good points. Obviously, this is um, many years in the making, but it's important, I think, to uh, follow through on, on Congress's mandate from Don Frank, but also be responsible, work with our fellow regulators, um, and, and do what we can uh, <clears throat> as an agency that has a seat at the FSOC. So uh, look forward to that continued collaboration um, certainly protecting the data and being very vigilant about what we do and how we do it. But I think this is a good thing overall for the markets, for transparency, for risk management, uh, and, and financial stability. Um, and, and regarding the earlier rule, I want again to thank the team, um, Josh uh, Sterling as the director of DSIO and Elizabeth, Amanda, and Pamela as well, the entire OGC team, and of course, uh, chief economist for the work they've done uh, on any matters today as well. Um, I think this is really a good step today, um, but again, as I've emphasized and as my um, colleagues have, both Commissioner Stump and Berkowitz, um, this is just one step in a longer process. As I emphasized as well, we need to continue working, um, engaging, and making sure that our rule sets are up to date, um, reflect the markets fairly, um, but also fulfill um, and provide us with the information we need to fulfill our responsibility. So. Thanks again to the team. Um, it's great to be here, obviously, by video again. I hope everyone's doing well, um, and, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Quintan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first uh, start by thanking you for the conversations you've had with me on um, the issues we've uh, discussed today, uh, as well as your staff, and uh, the conversations that uh, uh, I and my office have had with my uh, fellow commissioners and their staffs uh, to try to reach consensus today, uh, which, which we have. Uh, I appreciate all of their in involvement and their perspectives and their points of view, um, and I'm glad we were able to find uh, some common ground despite some at OFR. That's incredibly important work, and he is a fine public servant, and my, uh, my compliments to him uh, for that. I will be having um, uh, a statement uh, uh, that comes out that details my uh, position on on the MOU, and I think it's um, it's important for this agency uh, to share information that OFR needs uh, to conduct um, its responsibilities um, as the research arm of FSOC in the adjudication of its responsibility uh, of financial stability and systemic uh, risk, um, as opposed to um, uh, what we do and what our job is, which is a markets regulator, uh, and to look at the individual. Um, activities and customer protection of these funds. Uh, but I appreciate your leadership, Mr. Chairman. I think there you know, have been some comments that these things have been a long time coming. Um, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that work has been done on them over that period of time. Uh, it takes initiative and leadership to get them across the finish line or to start them in the first place. My compliments to you and to the, the, the team at DSIO, the teams at DSIO uh, that have uh, brought these before us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner Quinten. Uh, no formal statement from me other than to thank all of the staff that participated in today's call, uh, today's meeting, 
Uh, of course, our special guest, uh, Director Felicetti, thank you so much for joining for this this uh, this important occasion. Uh, and 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 two final thoughts from me in closing. Uh, first of all, as as many had had said, uh, we are we are our director of the Division of Enforcement is moving on. Jamie McDonald. Uh, this morning, we announced that we had had a historic enforcement year. Uh, that's obviously due to, in large part, to the vision and leadership of Jamie McDonald and all of the leaders in the enforcement division, which is our largest division, uh, and it's critical and, and very um, important, and in fact, one of our five strategic goals, that we're tough on those who break the rules. And by doing so, uh, we can also, at the same time, enhance the, uh, the, the environment for market participants, which many of what we've done today does does, in fact, do. So we have a Town regulation requires uh, a multiplicity of important strategic goals, all of which are mutually reinforcing. But I also want to thank, in terms of the enforcement, my fellow commissioners and particularly their staffs. Uh, to be to have the year that we had required a uh, tremendous amount of work throughout the year, throughout the summer in particular, but we had 10 closed meetings. Uh, we always talk about our open meetings. Today's the 16th open meeting of my chairmanship. But we also had 10 closed meetings and, and, and literally uh, more than 100 cases that went through seri the seriatim process this, this year. So I just want to thank my fellow commissioners and their staff in particular for all of the outstanding work and diligence. The second point I wanted to make is that October will be an exciting month, hopefully, for the commission. Um, this, this, this may be our first open meeting of October, but it will not be our last. So I'd I tell everyone, uh, stay tuned. You're going to see more from us. We'll also have advisory committees planned and, and all sorts of other things. So uh, I ask the commissioners, is there any further business? Okay. There being no further business, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Terrific. Uh, those in favor of adjourning the meeting will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. And again, I'm grateful to the CFTC staff, as always, for their outstanding work. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much.